for those that need it. And um, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have questions during um, the session, please feel free to use the Q&A section of the Zoom feature so that we can be able to address those questions as we go, either written form or we'll take them live and answer them. And we do have dedicated time at the end so that we can have also um, some frequently asked questions that people have about the application process. Um, and, uh, and there's been a lot of questions about uh, logistics and travel um, since we are returning back to in-person field work. So welcome everyone. Um, we'll get started for um, in terms of keeping time. Um, so my name is Moni and I'm the research officer here at the REACH Alliance and um, been working here for about three cohorts. So we're now, um, have been working with three groups of students at U of T and recruiting across three campuses. Um, so the, our agenda today is um, to cover kind of an overview of what the REACH Alliance and the opportunity is for US students. Um, and then the second piece, which is, Equally important is hearing directly from one of our current researchers who is have gone through the process of the application and then now is about halfway through her experience. Um, Kyra, who is um, from Team Philippines, and she'll talk about her case study and what um, motivated her to apply. And then um, we'll review the kind of nuts and bolts of the application process. Uh, there's a few changes that we've made this year that I'll review. And then we'll open it up for questions. And so we look forward to um, your engagement. So to start us off is um, we were founded at the Monk School of Global Affairs um, here. And uh, in 2015, from being a research project to now being a global alliance. Um, so we have scaled up over the past years um, in an exciting way. So when you join REACH, you'll be uh, uh, joining us with a, a, a global alliance of eight universities from across the world, including U of T. So we are um, funded by the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, and we've been inspired by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we are student-driven um, and faculty-mentored research and it's focused on research and leadership development. And part of what the focus of the research is on examining what are the critical interventions and innovations that are reaching the hardest to reach. We know that there's already a lot of great work being done at grassroots level, a national level and global levels to really um, provide important goods and services to the hardest to reach. But what's missing is the gap of learning from them and how they were able to reach the hardest to reach and then uh, disseminating that information widely. And so that's what our research is focused on. And we're student driven because it is the students that drive the process of determining the research question, the methodology, putting together the application for REB, and then um, doing all the work to, to get the field work ready and then collecting the data in person. Um, wherever their interventions are. So, um, and faculty come on board as being support and mentors, but they're not driving the process and it's not their research question. So we really are kind of flipping um, the dynamics of what typical academia is by giving our researchers the opportunity to be co-PIs of their own research, supported of course by um, us uh, uh, in the REACH Alliance, but also by a faculty that can support their rigor um, and the oversight needed for the research. So you can see all of our research um, that has been already completed and currently in place on our um, case study page, and as well as the publications of how, um, where the research has landed after they've been published. Next, um, we'll just kind of overview our vision is really to investigate how to get the important stuff to everyone everywhere. And the mission that we have is one is to fulfill the full achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But the way that we do it is by equipping and empowering on the next generation of global leaders to create knowledge and inspire action on reaching their hardest to reach. So we want to inspire action by the actual research that is relevant, but we also want to develop the 
leadership and professional development of students to be able to tackle global problems um, as they move on into different areas of their careers and sectors. Um, so we've had about 240 researchers um, be, participate in our program, and that's now across the Alliance, who have now collectively uh, published 40 case studies. So, um, and the eight universities um, you'll see in our next slide is actually the global reach um, in this map. So at the bottom, you'll see um, the logos of the eight universities that comprise of the Global Reach Alliance. Um, we've got two universities in the UK, University of Oxford and the University is, um, is College London. And then we've got um, two universities in Africa, um, one in Ghana, Ashesi University, and one at the University of Cape Town. We've got um, Singapore Management University joining us next year. They're now in the planning stages in Asia. And then in Australia, we have Melbourne University. So you can, less, at least when not, um, last is Tech Monterey, which is in Mexico, our longest standing partner um, in the Alliance. So you can see the black kind of institutional um, icons on our map. Um, and they represent those universities. And so what's exciting is you see the spread of researchers and students across the world doing exact similar research um, in their local communities or abroad um, on the SDG. So the dark colored um, map areas are where um, the countries that have been investigated and the numbers are the SDG numbers that correspond with it. So you can see the spread and there's also lots of countries that we have yet to learn from. Um, so next is, this is a, a sense of who our faculty mentors are at U of T. And we're showing this so that you can see that not only are our students interdisciplinary, but our faculty and expertise that we bring on uh, is also key to um, being interdisciplinary. So we've got faculty from the engineering, uh, faculty from the information um, sciences, um, from health studies, geography, political science, public health, and social work. So you could see that you have an ability to um, join REACH and join a truly interdisciplinary um, community. Um, equity, diversity, and inclusion is the key of what, why we do it and how we do it. And um, it is the reason why REACH exists is to address the equity gap around the world by highlighting um, the locations um, and people groups that aren't being reached um, with essential goods and services. So, um, and, but it's also important by um, how we relate to each other and how we relate with our partners and the research projects. Um, and so we have developed uh, through a very participatory process and U of T's anti-racism and cultural diversity office, a charter that is a guiding principle that we always refer to and we're always continuing to refer to, to improve and innovate our practices here, but also how we um, do our work in case study selection. Um, so our program, actually we'll go to the next slide, is, um, the next slide, Simona, um, is first part of our program is we have a three prong approach, which is one is a performance coaching. Um, so as we're bringing interdisciplinary students together, they have to learn how to uh, talk to each other, how to work together. And now within a very short period of time, pull off a research study from start to end. And so in order to accelerate the teamwork, we um, hire professional team coaches who will work with you on an individual level with one-to-one -one coaching. And then they will work with you on a team level to see how the team is operating and organizing and ways to accelerate and, and improve your practices so that everyone's on the same page. And then we um, started a new practice of bringing a community practice. So we don't just wanna like learn about leadership in our own teams that we want to actually learn how are other teams also learning about leadership um, from across the global cohort and bring them together as team leads to discuss um, ways to innovate and share practices. So the second pillar of the REACH program that you would be part of is a skills development workshop series. So we curate a host of different workshops and we provide different tools and um, different uh, de professional development opportunities. Um, that would allow you to one, um, have the tools that you need to do your, carry out your REACH research. So a lot of our alumni come back and share their insights and expertise. 
um, and our faculty that have um, world-class research and expertise as well come and share. Um, but we also um, provide professional development, which, you know, on topics such, such as, you know, communication, uh, networking, and a special career development series that um, where you can have a one-to-one -one career coaching session with one of our uh, team coaches. So um, all of these skills are meant to, one, accelerate your ability to do the REACH research, but two, as we said, we want to develop global leaders that have the skill sets to know how to work in teams and interdisciplinary perspectives. And last but not least is our research process, which is a third pillar that is well known for. Um, our research, is the cycle is 12 to 14 months. So that means it's a co-curricular activity. So while you're carrying out your academic programming, you're adding reach alongside it. Um, it, it there is, um, each team will work with a fa dedicated faculty mentor who will work with you and meet regularly with you as your research process is going on. Um, and so you'll start with doing desk research and literature reviews and learning everything that you need to know about your topic to be able to determine what's the gap that you as a team can now um, need to fill um, through your primary research and data collection. And then once you kind of go into the field, you'll write a case report in which it's and will be published on our website. And then uh, for those teams that want to continue to disseminate the research um, create different knowledge translation deliverables um, as appropriate. And then we'll share some of that in a bit, but this is a visual um, um, kind of way to see the process from recruitment all the way to case study selection to secondary desk research, primary research, and the um, report writing. And so you'll see that as through the research process, the skill development workshop series and coaching is also simultaneous in that. Um, so what have our students done with their research? And actually they have, um, some have gone on and really um, translated in many different mediums. So we're not just focused on academic papers, which, but it's, if it's relevant, such as the first um, example here, which is a public um, health case study on elimination of polio in India, they were able to continue and submit a peer-reviewed journal article and that was published by the British um, Medical Journal. Um, so you could see that they want to um, target public health practitioners that are in which their case study was relevant for. But then we have a group of five alumni who worked on different case studies on cash transfers uh, programs and um, they were able to you know, write a group paper together and got published in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. So this kind of gray literature um, in which a lot of practitioners are reading um, is also an important outlet for the REACH research to um, be disseminated as well as op opinion ads and newspaper articles about relevant topics as well. So you can see some of those in the publication section of our website. Um, and last but not least, we also, you know, part of our commitment is that we don't want just the research to be sitting on a shelf or on a website, um, you know, as an archive, but actually we really want to provide our students the opportunity to share their research to key insight communities in which you have decision makers, you have academia, you have private sector, public sector, um, all in the room to be able to um, hear about the research, but then also have conversations with the researchers about what is the kind of gaps, what are the relevant questions that different key stakeholders would have. And so we convene a research conference um, in which Kyra was able to participate in, in October and her team and just um, be able to have a place to um, present and and uh, practice not just communication skills, but also uh, an opportunity to highlight their work. So at this point, um, we, I'll give the mic over to Kyra to speak about her experiences. Um, and then please continue to share your questions in the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Moni. So yeah, as she said, my name is Kyra. I use she, her pronouns. And I am a uh, student- you muted, Kyra. Kyra. My mic says that I'm not muted. You're good, like, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm a UTM student in the Master of Science and Sustainability Management program, and I'm in my second year of that program. 
And as Moni said earlier, I'm on Team Philippines of uh, this cohort of the REACH Alliance. So I'm right in the middle of my REACH experience. Um, so I believe I've got about 10 minutes to kind of share some information with you. And I'm going to talk a bit about kind of my background, where I came from, my REACH project, and the kind of focus we have on reaching the hardest to reach in our particular case study as well as how my master's program really links well with the REACH Alliance. And I've kind of done the two of them kind of for this last year of my degree. And then a bit more about my kind of REACH researcher experience in general and what I've got out of the program. I'm happy to answer any other specific questions that people have as well. So I guess we can move on to the next slide for a bit of information about myself. Perfect. So I actually come from Vancouver Island in British Columbia. So coming from the West Coast, I did my um, undergraduate degree at the University of Victoria on the island. And I actually did a Bachelor of Commerce. So I'm coming from kind of a business perspective. But during my degree, I did a particular fo focus areas around sustainability, as well as a social purpose business and nonprofit business models. So a lot of the work I did um, was around kind of the ideas of social entrepreneurship and bridging um, kind of some of the principles in commerce and business and the private sector with some of my own values around, you know, ecosystem and social structures. So that's what my, I kind of did for my degree. Once I graduated, I worked in Victoria for a year at um, an Indigenous women-owned consulting firm called Two Worlds Consulting, where I was a sustainable development analyst. It was a small company, so I kind of did, I wore like 12 different hats and got just a ton of experience in kind of um, environmental and social consulting for um, Indigenous partners. And after I kind of worked for a year, decided it was time to pursue uh, another degree and moved out to Toronto to start my degree at UTM in the Master of Science and Sustainability Management program. For those who are familiar with the program, it really takes a kind of holistic, you know, environmental, social, and economic view of sustainability, and we kind of learn about it across lots of different spectrums, and I'll speak about that a little bit later as well. Um, this past summer, I worked for the Boston Consulting Group here in Toronto with the Center for Canada's Future, which is a kind of climate change and economic think tank and kind of public policy and innovation sort of sort of lab and I did climate change research there and then in my final year of my degree I've been kind of balancing my MSCSM research and capstone with the team Philippines work that I will um, talk about now so team Philippines is investigating a project called the Mangahan Low-Rise Building Project, um, and it is a climate resilient or flood resilient specifically um, project in Passing City, which is in Metro Manila. So the population that we're really investigating here, the hard to reach population is that of informally settled um, kind of urban Filipino people who are living along a floodway which of course is prone to floods. And when there was climate events, such as typhoons or kind of storm surge, then there's um, kind of, the housing is um, unstable kind of in those areas. And so with the kind of increase of these climate events, the housing that is already kind of informally settled and kind of lacks access to some services is constantly being battered. So it's not a particularly safe or kind of sustainable place for these communities to live. So we are kind of working with the Alliance of People's Organizations along the Mangahan Floodway, which is a community-led group who really came together after a particularly bad um, typhoon in 2009 and basically led a community, you know, bottom-up development to say, you know, we need secure housing, we need safe housing um, that is accessible for, you know, for the people in our community and it's culturally appropriate for us as well. So they kind of overcame some challenges with the government and developers and other property ownership challenges and are on their way to building climate resilient housing. So they were really successful in this. 
and kind of the sustainable development goals that this aligns with mostly for our group is around sustainable cities and communities, as well as climate action, specifically climate resiliency. Um, and because it was a community led initiative, where really the people who were the hardest to reach were the ones doing the, you know, the development, they were doing that act activities themselves. We wanted to understand how they were able to mobilize to lead that development of this resilience and of this project within their own community and kind of the barriers that they overcame. So some of the things that our study will, will kind of capture and discuss is, of course, we need to understand the Philippines context. Uh, we're looking at what it means for the community to be resilient, as well as you know, climate change resilience. We're looking at topics of mobilization and activities that lead to effective mobilization. We're exploring the partnerships that were required and the collaboration that was required to make this project a success, as well as the kind of long-term impact of this project. And once the housing is built, what does that mean for the community down the line? So that's um, the project that we're currently working on. And um, yeah, we got our research ethics mostly mostly there, just one uh, small change to approve and working on getting our interviews and things set up shortly. So exciting times. Um, so back to the MSCSM program. As a sustainability program with REACH, who is a sustainable development goal kind of based organization, of course, there's lots of really great ties. Really quickly, kind of on the coursework side, in MSCSM, we do a lot of different courses and different topic areas, but they all kind of connect through the sustainability lens and through the sustainable development goal lens. A couple that I found particularly um, helpful for my REACH experience were things like sustainability law and policy, social dimensions of sustainability, ecosystem science, and things like that. But really, depending on your case, there's lots of connections to make. And some of the electives I've taken include building community resilience, and global climate policy, which were also relevant. But within the second year of MSCSM, you have almost unlimited options of electives that you can take from the kind of graduate level courses, which includes courses at Monk School or at Dalalana or um, at Rotman and all these other different courses, the Faculty of Environment or Geography. So it's kind of really build your, your own adventure in terms of what you can kind of um, get out of the program and how you could possibly connect it to your own case study. Um, the second year of the MSCSM program, which I'm currently in, is also packed full of activities, things like kind of case competition, summer internship between the academic years, ex um, international exchange opportunities, research and capstone. So I kind of already mentioned my internship at BCG, but again, it's create your own adventure whatever kind of professional development or you think is relevant. And there's lots of great connections and opportunities with development organizations or international governmental organizations, things like that. Um, research, again, you choose whatever you want to research about. I'm researching community resilience in uh, Victoria, where I did my undergrad in BC. So of course, some of the themes are connected to my work with REACH as well. And Capstone, personally, I'm working on a sustainability curriculum for a private high school. Um, but again, you can pretty much work with any organization you want and create a sustainability, kind of a plan for a sustainability initiative. So, so many ways that it links to REACH and how you can kind of tailor the, the degree to um, support, support your work with REACH or supplement or kind of have them um, be as similar to each other or as different as you want. Um, and then I'm happy to answer questions about any of these more specifically, but um, a couple of things that I wanted to say about my experience so far, some of the most impactful things for me have been um, the global events and just really getting to connect with our global partners, particularly in person at the October conference. It was so nice to meet people from um, other schools. Um, the other impactful piece really has been uh, the research kind of team diversity. And of course, the REACH teams are very um, diverse in terms of background and culture and like different academic backgrounds and things like that. But I found particularly for the research, it's so eye-opening to have people have done 
either no research or qualitative research or quantitative research or different types of methods. And there's so much you can learn from that. And it's been fantastic. Um, as well as just it's been really imp impactful to kind of take myself out of the Canadian context and really immerse in this Philippines context to, you know, view development and sustainable development with a new lens. Um, that's been very impactful for me. Um, some of the biggest benefits of the REACH experience so far, of course, like I said, the network, the global network, kind of the exposure to all these different really interesting, really smart people all around the world has been great. Um, the skills development series, really getting kind of critical, of course, research, but also just critical thinking skills and things like that, that have been um, very beneficial. And also just being surrounded by passionate people. So I know undergrad graduate studies can be very challenging, you know, and it's sometimes hard to kind of keep yourself going forward and when you feel overwhelmed with work. But one of those things with REACH is that everyone's so passionate about what you're doing that it makes it easier to kind of push forward and um, be excited about what's what's coming next. So that's definitely a benefit. Um, in terms of personal development, I have found that um, I've developed my kind of understanding different roles that I can play within a team. There's a bit of a rotation of roles. So it's nice to be able to try different things and understand what your strengths are um, as a lead versus kind of other roles in the team. Um, career coaching and advice. Moni mentioned the one-on-one -on -one career coaching sessions, which I have coming up next month that I'm really looking forward to. Um, as well as just getting international experience, like anything that you can do to kind of expand your horizons and get more international experience and more diverse experience is um, amazing. And then I guess as we transition into the application part of this session, I realize I've been kind of blabbing on for a while, so I'll leave this one short, but in general, I would say when you're applying, you want to know personally for you, why you're applying, why you want to be part of REACH, what you want to get out of REACH, what you think you can contribute to REACH, just really personally for you, like knowing deep down why you want to do it is going to be really helpful to guide your application. Um, I would also say, you know, REACH requires a lot of creativity and openness and adaptability and just like the ability to pivot and um, kind of see the big picture of things. So anything that you can do to showcase those sorts of skills or experiences you've had would be, I think, very useful for the REACH experience. And then the last thing is that don't try to be anybody else because everyone is bringing so many different skills and experiences to this to the team. And there's no kind of one mold of what the perfect REACH researcher looks like that doesn't exist. So don't try to be you know, something that you think they're looking for. Just own what you have and own your own unique experiences. Um, so that's what I would say for application advice. And with that, I guess we can move into the application, more logistics stuff from Moni. Thanks, Kara. That's a great segue. Um, as our, you'll know from our um, website, the only eligibility that we have is that you are an upcoming registered U of T student. Um, in the fall 2023 and winter 2024 years. So um, that's, and that's across undergraduate, graduate and doctorate level studies. And so our teams are quite diverse, not just in disciplines, but education level, because every um, student has something to contribute and a perspective and skill set uh, uh, that um, becomes important in a team. And um, so if you're wondering, am I eligible? That's the only requirement. In terms of the traits, um, the, these are listed on our website, um, and there's one question this year related to this, but these are traits that we have learned over, you know, the years of doing research of and, and working with students is these are the traits, one, that end up being really important for the success of the researchers, but two, these are also traits that are identified by um, different um kind of sp spheres of um, career readiness and traits that are needed in the in the upcoming kind of um, 21st century workplace. These are the traits that are also identified as being key. Um, and so we're trying to build those two gaps is 
um, make sure that people have an understanding of what the REACH research position and opportunity um, is um, required of you. But secondly, to understand that you have some sort of basis of being familiar with the, the kinds of settings that you'll be exposed to at REACH. It doesn't mean that you need you know, all of these skill sets, but it needs to, you need to be able to articulate why you wanna develop these skills um, through REACH as well. So it is a co-curricular activity, which is why we do say the ability to prioritize it is an important one because you have to juggle your schoolwork, you have to juggle all the activities at REACH, but also, um, every other you know, extracurricular activity. Many of our students are leaders in all sorts of ways and leading clubs and, and doing this and that on campus. So um, there is a lot of prioritization that you need to do, and that is an important piece. Team players, important one that I wanna mention is that this isn't just doing a group paper. This is actually like learning to work as a team and have ownership of every single milestone that you deliver. So it's not like you do a group paper, everyone goes into their you know, um, computers and writes their paper and comes back and you submit one holistic thing. But actually, the, the kind of teamwork that is required is everyone needs to be contributing and involved at every single process to move um, to move things forward. So it is a much more involved um, training, but also that you are given the support through the coach of how to organize yourself, what are the best practices on organizing meetings and agendas and, and making sure that you're making the best use of the time um, as well. And um, lifelong learner and action oriented are kind of combined in that you will come into reach not knowing everything. And so you don't, we don't expect students to be content expertise or research expertise, but we do expect that they have enjoy the challenge of learning something new and that they aren't going to be scared by knowledge gaps because everything can be learned and you'll be doing a lot of peer learning, but it's the um, drive and motivation to, to fill those gaps when, there, when it exists um, that you enjoy. And then the action oriented is because it's a student led initiative, we want students that are, are really gonna take the responsibility at hand and, and, and run with things. So um, there's no faculty that's gonna tell you what to do and, and give you step-by-step -step guidelines. We give you milestones, we give you lots of resources and support, but it is up to the students to really organize themselves and, and use all the tools that we give to then uh, carry out um, the research project. So in terms of um, how do you apply, um, you there's an online form and you'll be asked six questions, short answers. There's only 250 words um, entry, so they're not long, um, but they, they do require um, quite reflective uh, thinking. Um, these are not just like experiences or typical um, kind of interview questions. We really want to get to know who you are, what your motivations are, what are the kinds of ways that that you think about um, working with others um, and being able to pivot because these are kind of key things that you know being flexible open-minded um, and curious to learn are key things that we're seeing are, are important and of course um, this year we added questions about like not just where what are your past and what's your current but also where do you want to go and how does reach fit into that um, and there is a section for required documents. Um, these are typical resume, um, unofficial transcripts. So if you're in first year and you don't have full two year or full year of courses to show, you can show a, whatever your previous year uh, um, resume um, transcript was. Um, and then what's unique to reach is this annotated transcript. So, um, there's no GPA cutoff that is required at REACH. We're not looking for grades, we're looking for skill sets and perspectives. And so what we want to provide is everyone has an opportunity to tell us who they are by their course selection. Um, and also an opportunity to tell us, um, explain maybe there's something on your transcript that maybe you're not as proud of or, or the gr grade is really low, but, um, but there's a story behind that. And, um, and oftentimes we don't want to necessarily, um, you know, judge someone by their grade because there's always something, a context and personal life that has impacted. Or there's some students that took a course that was really outside of their um, 
research or or field domain, but they got a low grade, but learned so much from it because they went outside their comfort zone. So what we want to do is give you a chance to show us who you are and, and your reflections, your what you learned and what your passions are through your transcript. So please select five courses and speak about it individually or, or select five and speak about it as one collective. And then we do ask you to submit at your activity list what you're thinking of joining next year or things that you're already committed to, because this gives us a sense of um, what's already on your plate and how REACH will fit into that. Deadline is February 12. It's a Sunday night at midnight. So please make sure to hit submit before midnight. Um, and you'll have to do everything in one kind of um, session. It's on Microsoft Forms um, in internal U of T system. So after you submit, um, everyone will get a response um, by February 26. That's our hope. And um, those that are, are selected to move forward um, will conduct interviews in March. Before we used to have multiple sets of interviews, and Kyra will be able to tell you there's multiple, um, but through their feedback this year, we've decided to cut back and we'll do one interview which is why we've kind of increased some of the questions on our paper application. Um, and then um, you, that panel will include alumni, faculty mentors, and staff. So it's not, there's always at every stage of assessment, uh, multiple people that will be looking at your application because um, our whole community is involved um, in reviewing and, and having a say of, um, of the researcher cohort. Um, there is also an optional student equity survey. This mimics the U of T student equity survey. And while um, it is optional, we highly encourage everyone to fill it out because it helps us know um, as well and assess our own recruitment strategy and, and whether um, our equity, diversity, and inclusion charter is um, our values are lining up to um, who is applying to reach and who's having access to the opportunity. We do have an in-person uh, orientation session. So once um, the final researcher cohort is selected uh, by the end of March, um, there will be an onboarding um, in-person um, session in April while it's winter exams, I know, but um, hopefully everyone will be still in Toronto before they kind of disperse over the summer. And then over the summer months, um, there's uh, you'll be working with your research teams and getting the research questions started. So, and it will be virtual. And if there are any events, it will be flex time in the evenings because we know um, students are involved in work placements or, or internships and that. Um, so we'll try to be flexible to meet those needs. Um, so in this section, we'll open up the floor to Q&A. I know there's a couple here that we've received. So I'll read those out first. Um, and then we'll kind of get through um, sessions. I also am noticing, um, I think, no, um, one of our other researchers at UTM was online, but now he he had to, I think he had to go to his appointment. So I was jumped off, but I wanted to give uh, Mena an opportunity to say something if he was here. Okay, so the first question is, who selects a case study question? Does each researcher pitch a topic? That's an important question. So if it depends now, last year, Kyra was part of the cohort for the last couple of years at U of T. Um, there's a pitching session that students do in pairs. They, you work in pairs over the summer, um, and then you identify a case study, um, an innovation that's reaching the hardest to reach. You pitch it to the group based on a, a set criteria that we provide guidelines for, and then the community votes in on it, and that's how the final um, case studies are selected. What we're doing this year in the upcoming year will be different process. Um, one, from our learnings, and two, based on some of the challenges that we've seen some of our teams encounter through this process, is we will be working with community organizations to collaborate on the case study questions. So um, the teams this year will have a chance to still have a see all of the case study organizations but then the process of determining the research question will be in collaboration with those partners. So um, that's kind of how it will be changed this year because this aligns better with kind of our um, understanding now as we're doing research and want it, and reaching the hardest to reach and, and working with community organizations that um, the most impact of a research um, it involves always a participation of those that are uh, most 
affected by the work. So we've learned that um, working with community organizations um, from more earlier stages um, is more beneficial and it provides also an easier process for our researchers to carry out their um, their um, processes of organizing logistics, um, having a, a partner is always much more smoother um, to organize a field part of the research. So I, I hope that I've answered that question. Um, the, yeah. I was gonna say, just to clarify on that, um, maybe make it clear for the person who asked the question too. So is the pitching process still going to be the same where students kind of seek out a possible intervention and pitch but then make an effort to partner with that organization or kind of target organization before the kind of question is formulated and finalized? Or are the organizations and initiatives going to come from the reach side now and not come from the students? And the students have like a selection of kind of pre-approved or pre um yeah, pretty, that's a good pretty. question. Yeah, so we are flipping it. We are flipping it because um, what we've learned working with Indigenous communities, we've learned with working other community groups that do this kind of community-based work, is that they want to be involved from the beginning. They, You need to have their buy-in from the beginning processes that, yes, they are interested in having a group help support a question that they're curious about. What that question is, I think, um, the research, it could be just a problem space. It could be an organization that works with refugees, but the question is unknown. And that's something I just through learning about an organization, their needs and their work uh, could be a process of um, getting to that question and um, together. Um, so I, it's, we're just still trying to figure that out. We have lots of, you know, as you know, um, we have a global um, network in which organizations that are doing important work with um in various fields and different sdg areas um and so we're trying to also curate that power in terms of um highlighting some of those organizations um but the questions could be um done in collaboration with the researchers and so maybe that's a pitching that they have to do internally within the teams or with the partner you know so a lot of it is kind of we are marking making the road as we walk is, is how I like to see it and it, it is um you know feedback is an important tool for us we always try to learn from from the experiences of previous um so that we can improve the process and align closer to our values so that's our our effort is to do that so to be determined, basically, um, but that's kind of how we're um, seeing it based on feedback and experiences we've had uh, with local organizations. Our next question here is, for current graduate students, do we need to submit our undergraduate transcripts? Um, so you only need to submit if you're a first year student and you don't have like maybe a full set of courses that you can share about it for your annotated transcripts. So, um, if you only have um, five courses, let's say, um, in your as a graduate student because you're in your first year of studies, you can um, submit your undergraduate transcript as well. If you want to talk about courses that you took in your undergrad that kind of speak closer to what you want to speak about than just being forced to use the five courses or less than that um, on your graduate student's course. So we don't require you to submit undergraduate transcripts only if you need to refer to courses um, due to lack of courses um, in your graduate studies currently. Can I apply if I'm graduating June? Yes, so you will be graduating at the end of winter, wait, June this year? Yeah, yeah so the, June this, this year would be that you're, you wouldn't be a student then in the fall and next winter. So unfortunately, um, it means you miss you miss the application now. You should have applied last year when Kyra did, because Kyra is graduating. So um, this is an opportunity for registered students. Um, okay, so those are four questions. Oh, one more question I see here: um, Will interdisciplinary applicants join and groups are formed? Well, while they are, I'm unsure how those those look like so you mean the team formations what does that dynamic look like 
Okay, that's a good, very good question. I'll, I can answer part of it in terms of the technical part of how we form teams. And then I'll, I'll ask Kyra to kind of share with her who our teammates are, maybe what degrees they're part of and how um, they're working together. So we are um, recruiting, we want as diverse as possible. So we've got engineers in our core, we've got uh, people from um, commerce and um, business backgrounds to um, humanities and peace conflict justice and geography students and all sorts of different students um, who have different ways of looking at a problem. And when we um, form teams, we each researcher can look at all the case study topics and put a preference. So maybe you have a preference to work on certain case studies based on your discipline or based on whatever the case topic is. Um, and so we always take into account what researchers want to work on. But the other part is also we're looking at spread. So if a case um, is on a climate change, um, you know, and it needs somebody with, you know, with kind of um, expertise in that area, we would also consider that because we don't want all of the um you know, students all in one team that have business backgrounds or that have humanities background. We need the diversity of um, fields and expertise on a team. And then also different levels of education as well, because an undergraduate student will have different skill sets and what a doctorate student can bring, but everyone brings something to the table that is of value. So it's working then figuring out what is it that each one can contribute. Um, and so, Kara, do you want to speak to um, how you guys work in your team and who's on your team that makes it diverse? Yeah, absolutely. So Team Philippines is a great example of a diverse reach team. So um, we have an undergraduate student who is part of the mental health and poli sci kind of program um, at UT Scarborough. Um, so bringing that kind of social sciences and kind of yeah, definitely the mental health um, and qualitative research side of things. And she's done ex um, kind of research lab work as well in, in the kind of social sciences. Um, myself as a business kind of background and then in the sustainability management program now um, as a graduate student. There's actually another MSCSM or sustainability management student in our cohort as well a first year um, of the program, so somebody in the junior class to me, um, but he has an architecture background, and so very, very different background from anybody else on the team. Um, it kind of brings that more technical perspective, and then we have a PhD student um, in epidemiology, and she also has a nutrition background in her master, so it's a very diverse group with lots of different experience, and some with, you know, less, I would say, um, kind of in terms of like architecture and commerce, less direct research experience from our half of the team. And then with the um, kind of social sciences research and the epidemiology, hard sciences research, you know, two strong researchers as well. Um, but in terms of how does it, what does it look like day to day? I, there haven't been like, it's not like there's crazy differences in kind of how we operate our team meetings or how we collaborate or how we brainstorm. It's kind of just like people can raise different questions and have different ideas of how something might play out. And, you know, our research question, of course, is we have one research question that we're all working on and that we agreed upon. Um, so it maybe it's not like the exact, you know, focus, the more technical side um, that maybe some other members of the team were looking for. Um, so we have to collaborate on that. But I would say it's there's not um, it's not difficult necessarily to work with all like people with different backgrounds, as long as you kind of keep the central goal and the spirit of collaboration. Um, it's so helpful to have people with just like completely different perspectives raise questions that you might not think of. So yeah, our team is very diverse. It's been great so far um, for us. We learn a lot from each other, so. Yeah, and I think like that diversity is in every te reach team right now is that kind of diversity is you'll always have that spread of disciplines. Um, and I would say that's where the team coaching comes to play because when teams are at different, you know, education levels, personal experiences and disciplines, um, 
is the level playing field is that nobody knows anything about the research topic. So together you're learning and together you're working out what the work plan is. Together you're, you're problem solving. So it, it's irregardless, everyone is new to the topic. So uh, that's the kind of leveling field. And, and then, but people can see, this is what I can contribute. And this is my strength. This is, this is you know, um, a perspective I can bring. And that's where you see, um, how to work in teams and, and add value. And that's what the coaches really help also do. There's a question here about during the reach, uh, research process, do the researchers go to the area in person to collect data? Yes. So we have um, in the last two years during um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we have been forced to do virtual data collection. But this is the first year now that we're returning to back to in-person Field work. So that, that does mean that our teams are able to travel to wherever their target um, location is. And so for Kyra, it will be the Philippines and particularly in this suburb of Manila. Um, and so she will be traveling and we're working through that right now, logistics of planning the field c collection for about two weeks in the field and then um, coming back to Toronto and then working with her team to write the analysis and insights in the case study report. So depending on, you know, we've got projects in Rwanda, we've got projects in Nepal, we've got projects in Barbados. So wherever the um, case study topic is, uh, that's where the uh, teams will be going and traveling with their mentor for two weeks um, in the summer term after all of the winter exams are completed um, and then going into the field and maximizing on those two weeks um, to interview all the key stakeholders um, on the ground. So there should be no academic commitment at that time. So exams should be done. And this is the kind of in-between time before people start their summer jobs or a placement. So we students have known that that fieldwork is part of the summer term. So we've communicated if they're signing up for summer placements or jobs that they're communicating well in advance what their availability is after field research. Are the researchers funded? Yes, that is the funding part. So this is a co-curricular activity. So you're, um, we don't provide, it's not a paid RA ship and um, there isn't like a universal course credit that we're granting everyone. It is um, co-curricular, but the advantage is that um, students get to co-author their own research study. Um, and two, um, they get to do field work um, that is all expenses paid. So. Um, Part of the funding that we receive is so that we can send students um, wherever their field research is. So all the way to Philippines, their flights, um, their accommodation and any logistical support that they need in order to carry out their interviews and data collection is all covered for. Um, and, um, and as well as the skills development workshop series, the coaching, those are all expenses that are covered by the experience. Um, so those aren't, um, there's no, added fees to cover that. So that is that is an important feature that um, REACH provides. Um, I guess so I'm just looking at the time. We've got five minutes. So maybe, um, is there any other uh, questions that people have? We'll, we'll take maybe one or two more. Um, but I want to ask, um, Kara, if you want to um, share a few, maybe last thoughts, what is the most enjoyable thing that you've you're taking away so far from the experience. You've done a lot of RHS too and different work studies. And, you know, how do you feel that, like, what's the value prop, I guess, um, that you see from yeah. Reach? Absolutely. I think, like, compare, I guess, like, you kind of brought up, I've done other kind of extracurricular, co curricular activities and, you know, different clubs or job opportunities. And I think something about Reach is that because it is a longer, time period it's not like you're just trying to quickly do a research project in one term you know outside your classes and it's not a summer job it's like a year plus and the plus is kind of open to interpretation as well as how far you want to take it and I feel like that's one of the things that really just cements it as like a very very different opportunity it, it is a big commitment but the kind of in I guess the endurance of the program and and really getting to follow something through with so much depth and really focusing on like this one project for for a good amount of time that you can actually feel really 
proud of your ownership and your kind of accomplishments over it and the connections you've built with your team, I think is just a really, what makes reach really different um, in general is, yeah, the, it's, it's, it's a big project and that's something that is, it's so valuable to be able to dedicate to that kind of for the full year and more. Um, I think that's one, one thing that kind of sets it apart from other co-curricular activities. Um, but so many things that I've enjoyed, particularly just like meeting all these other researchers from different faculties that I probably would have never met otherwise. So that's been amazing as well. Mm -hmm. Well said. And I would also just add that once you're in the community, you're in the community for life. As alumni, we engage them continuously to, with opportunities to share about the research, even it's, if it's five years old. Some of the researchers from five years ago when they went in the field, that insights are still relevant today when we're talking about vaccine uptake and um, and different issues. Those insights are um, continue to garner um, impact and opportunities we always provide for our alumni to stay engaged and continue to like learn from it and share about it in the years to come. So um, I think that's the thing is the ownership is there. You've developed such an intense a relationship with your researchers and often they, a lot of our teams like have those relationships for life um, and then the other part is like the the insights that you garner are not just a paper that's done and you never think about again it's actually content that you can continue to engage in uh, and will give you opportunities to continue to share about it um, and what you've learned from it in the years to come. So, um, and if you leverage all of those things well, it will actually open new doors of opportunity because um, workplaces want, um, are looking for leaders that um, have experience in the global context, have experience carrying out, you know, like market research, even like interviewing, setting up all the logistics around these um, skill sets are like really high in demand. Um, and just even navigating uh, uncertainty and problem solving and things, I think like being exposed to how to um, be able to work in a team in a constructive way, an effective way to still accomplish your goal is like a, a really important um, key uh, process that we provide. So um, we are at time. I just want to uh, take the moment to say thank you to Kyra for joining us and sharing insights. Thank you for Simone here, who you see um, who's been supporting us um, as a new research officer here. Um, and we'll um, follow up as well with an email. But if you have other questions, please feel free to reach out. We are available. And Kyra is also open to supporting uh, your questions. If you have other uh, questions that didn't get answered and you want to connect, um, she'll be available as well over email. Um, thank you so much. We look forward to your applications. That's